what we're focusing on in the first session this afternoon is looking at, at organizations who have really made radical cuts in carbon in the system, in the environment where they're working. And it was very clear from what Brian Hoskins said at the beginning of the day that we're all going to need to make these radical cuts. So the three finalists we're looking at today, um, in this session have all done work that's made really, really significant carbon cuts. In, but I think the interesting thing is they've done it in very, very different ways. So first of all, we'll see a film about the work of the Sustainable Energy Academy, who've helped people who've actually done this themselves get a public profile. So the first film... My name's Sarah Harrison. I'm a member of the Sustainable Energy Academy. Through them, I open my house to the general public. What we've done, crucially, is to insulate the whole house. It's like wrapping the house in a sleeping bag, an internal sleeping bag so that it's insulated under the floors on the ground floor, all the way up the inside of the external walls and over the roof. The most vulnerable bits as far as the thermal efficiency of a house are always the windows and doors. We put in here double glazed units and they're also draft stripped. This is a super efficient wood burning stove which burns to about 75-80% efficiency. These solar panels reduce the amount of energy that's required to heat our hot water by about 70-75%. When I started to work on this house, there was no knowledge or information generally available about what to do about existing houses. New build housing really has a very little effect, so we had to concentrate on the carbon emissions from existing housing, which have 15 times the energy saving potential. I became involved with uh, the SEA and John pretty much from the first time that I opened the house for visitors. We've left this uh, Perspex pane open so you can actually see inside, so all the visitors that come to the house can actually have a look and, and, and see how, how this particular might work for their house. I bought this house three years ago with the specific aim of renovating it to uh, a very high energy performance standard. SEA have pioneered a new way of getting information across to people. What we've got in this room is um, very modern insulation uh, materials. Uh, we've got an aluminium framework screwed to the wall um, and then the insulation screwed to that framework. Here you can see some exposed parts of the floor just to show visitors what they've, they've got in this situation. A typical uninsulated house will lose about 15% of its heat through the floor. It's an innovative way of using the local population to help the local population which helps the country. Just spraying in the recycled newspaper, it comes out of a nozzle dry, but the very fine water mist that comes out at the same time, turns it into paper mache, sprays into the hole, you just allow it to dry and then you can cover it over with plasterboard. Dead easy. And uh, people don't usually realise you can use recycled newspaper, so that's just a good thing about this particular window. It was my apprenticeship uh, for learning the difficulties, uh, for understanding the best things that work, and then to go out and replicate it in other people's homes afterwards. So on the back of that, I've set up my own business to to help people to renovate their homes as well. We need 500,000 houses changed per year. It's a very big task. Where do we start? The first problem that we found was lack of inspiration. So we set up a, a group of houses through the country so that the public could come, see, learn and be inspired to take action. Here's a reason for opening the house, but actually then I was able to see that there's a much bigger uh, desire to open the house and then I started meeting other people who open houses as well and you start to realise that you're not a weirdo. We've had over a thousand people come to this house now in the year and a half since it's been open. We're finding that with the feedback forms we've got that people are going home and 95% of them say we are going to go home and do something in our own home later. You believe what you can imagine and this is absolutely essential to move something from an intellectual idea into an emotional belief because people will only act in the longer term on emotional beliefs. Okay, I'll hand you over to John Doggett to tell you more about their work. John. Hi everybody. Um, I think that this Starting with why did we go into the retrofit? Here, this shows you 
what the savings are by 2050 of comparing two techniques. The first one on the left is if we made a car a policy of having carbon neutral houses starting tomorrow, by 2050 we'd only save 3.6% of the carbon uh, 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 in, the, uh, in the domestic sector. Whereas uh, there's 15 times more savings being made if we look at the existing housing. So clearly that's a place, it's not to say we shouldn't be doing that, but we should be doing that really, really hard. When we started, there was virtually none of that. And uh, when we started to explore why there wasn't, uh, there were four reasons. Desire, there was lack of desire, there's lack of knowledge, what to do. There was lack of delivery capacity, and there's lack of incentives. Hey, that's a big, big project. <laughs> but luckily, there is a huge interest and that's what we found through the super homes. There's an enormous number of people who come there. So how do we start to tackle these four areas? Well, the first one is um, in the de improving desire aspect, a network of exemplar homes with at least 60% carbon reduction. That tells us where we've got to be in 2050. We're arguing 60% is on-site and 20% is off-site in decarbonizing of, in, uh, electricity. Um, it should be accessible to the public so that one idea can, and one project can be spread amongst thousands of people. And you have to learn this from a, a trusted source, okay? And the householder is a fantastically <coughs> trusted source. Um, it has to be a touch feel experience. You can't do this with megaphone messaging. People have to actually touch and see what they've got, what it is. Do the rooms get smaller? Do they get larger? What, what about the cornices? All the little details that make their home their home, not something that comes as a generalization from government. And we need to have a lot of these houses. We reckon about 500 in, uh, if, if we're going to have this, that everybody is within 20 minutes, half an hour of one of these houses. Okay, what do they look like? Well, this is Russell Smith's house. You've seen a bit of it. Um, outside, very ordinary, Victorian, very often. Inside, a whole welter of stuff, but it all goes behind the plasterboard and disappears. This is not a place that has um, worry bits, uh, and, and, um, and which people find very com comforting. The open days. Okay, that's really, really important. Cam Camden, when we opened it, had, on average, 120 visitors every Sunday. Right. And that just went on, and it was actually going up as we were going on. So it's very important to have these open days. For roughly, for every house so far, and we've only been going for a year and a half, for every house that's opened, there are a thousand people who've seen, been through that house so far. So it's got a tremendous multiplying effect. As I said, there's 28 houses, uh, 30,000 visited in the first year. There are video fly-throughs of some of those houses on our website. We questionnaire people and a tremendous satisfaction rate on it. And what's even more important, people want to do something at the end of it all. We also have a My Green Builder database, uh, which gives a star rating um, of, of, of people that, uh, of empl uh, sorry, suppliers and um, installers who th th these people have regarded as being uh, um, doing a good job or as well those who've done a bad job. With good advice, people can uh, spend an average of 200 pounds um, as, when they go away. Some people turn to 20,000, some people are to two pounds, but people spend a lot of money on this. We need to get to five to 10% of homeowners in the, in the first 10 years. That's the start of an S curve. Remember that 500,000 per year that we've got to get ramp up to, but we can start off, have to start off fairly small. Um, and we need 500 houses. Um, where are they located? We go on our website, they're all over the country. There's big areas that are not in, and we're trying to fill those all the time. Um, anybody knows houses that are, that have saved at least 60% of their carbon, let me know, please. We'd, we'd love to talk with them. We work with others. There's a huge array of people that we've worked with and set up, actually, the existing Homes Alliance. Um, which is WWF, and Friends of the Earth, uh, through to Association Conservation Energy, um, and so on. So the, there's a whole variety of people all working on the same problem and singing exactly the same tune. Improving incentives. 
That was the last thing. We need to have two billion pounds um, to kick start this process. A billion in uh, in both uh, housing association and in private sector. We're campaigning with them. What's the future? 500 super homes within five years, two billion kickstart money, a buy green builder database so that people can go and find out, uh, get the capacity building that we need, widespread knowledge of what to do, and the early adopters inspired to action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. We're now going across the world to Bihar in India, um, where a business, Saran Renewable Energy, has been able to replace the use of very high carbon diesel generators with locally grown biomass to generate electricity. And as the film will show, their work isn't just about supplying electricity, it's also about providing income to the farmers who grow the biomass. So we'll now see the film of the work of Saran Renewable Energy. Garka, a densely populated bustling village in Bihar, close to the river Ganges. It suffers from an extreme shortage of reliable mains electricity. Many businesses and essential services are struggling forced to rely on polluting diesel generators. The villagers' livelihoods are blighted by constant blackouts, which can last for days. This all started to change 18 months ago, thanks to Saran Renewable Energy. They brought in a high-quality, reliable and renewable form of electrical power. It's called gasification. I feel very happy because I'm helping a lot of people in and around Garkhan. Local farmers supply the plant with biomass fuel. This is fed into the gasifier every 15 minutes. The wood is heated to several hundred degrees until it gives off a mix of flammable gases such as hydrogen and methane. This is the second part of the process. Once the biomass is burned and the gas produced, it comes through this pipe. The gases pass through a series of pipes where they are cooled, cleaned and filtered. From there, the pure gas, then it's fed into the generating set. The electricity produced from the gas is then distributed all over the village. This reliable supply of power has helped to improve health care in the village. Saran guarantees electricity to the clinic from 10 in the morning until 9 at night. The Bihar government state electricity board isn't capable of meeting the power demand. We have a nebulizer which needs a power supply. Before, due to the power cuts, we couldn't use it. And sometimes this resulted in death of the patient, including children. But ever since we have taken the connection from biomass plant, we have a regular electricity supply. Our patients are recovering better. Many small businesses have been revitalized. Now they have a guaranteed supply of electricity throughout their working day. First we were using mains power, then it stopped and we started using diesel generators. But then we were making a loss, so we started using biomass power. Every day it is saving us 200 rupees compared to what we were spending on diesel generators. We are getting more work done more efficiently. Our income has gone up a bit as well. We have no worries now. Most of the fuel that powers the gasifier is daincha a hardy, woody plant that grows quickly in waterlogged land. Growing dyncha is hassle-free and very easy. It doesn't need fertilizers, it doesn't require much effort, and it is very economical. It's generating money for our survival. It supports my family. It provides food and education for my children. But it's not all work and no play in Garka. The local cinema is also benefiting from renewable electricity. 
The picture quality is better when there are no power outages. Diesel generators don't give you the same quality, but I have to use alternatives because the mains power supply is disrupted at least 20 to 30 times a day. The old connection would disrupt the movie screening. There wasn't enough light. But ever since we have taken the power supply from the biomass plant, the screen is bright enough. It also gives very good voltage. This biomass gasification plant benefits people in several ways. It creates a livelihood for the farmers. It has generated income for them. They also get water because of the biomass plant. All the small industries have benefited. And it ensures public welfare too. It ensures smooth running of places like health clinics, which are crucial for treating patients and saving lives. The creation of this biomass gasification plant has already transformed the lives of over a thousand people. There are now plans to build more plants and extend this much needed spark to many more businesses and communities. I'll hand you over to Vivek Gupta, uh, Director of Saran Renewable Energy, to talk about their work. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will be telling you about how we replaced polluting diesel gensets at the same time change the lives of hundreds of farmers. <coughs> a little bit of background, uh, we are family owned grain trading business in uh, Saran district of Bihar and to counter the challenge of uh, the lack of electricity we set up this biomass gasification system which is uh, using local resources to meet the energy demands of the people. Bihar is one of the lesser developed states in India while India is a growth story, there are certain regions which are not growing as much as the rest. Bihar is one of them, where there are no industries and even farming is not so uh, good. There is high population density and the per capita income is really very low. There are a couple of reasons why this happened. Uh, to begin with, there was no electricity. The electricity board uh, was not in the position to supply electricity to the people maybe even meet 10% of the requirement. Due to which the people, both farmers as well as micro industries, turned to diesel generating gensets, which were very expensive, uh, about three times more expensive than grid power. Made uh, both farming as well as, as well as industry unviable. Uh, because farming uh, was unviable because in the dry season, uh, water was used from tube wells and th this was uh, done by electricity electric motor pumping sets which could not run which could run on diesel gen sets but were very expensive uh, due to which both agriculture as well as industries could not survive in fact most of them shut down and people moved out of the state to other st parts of the country to earn a living and the other problem which is very peculiar to the region uh, to the eastern part of the country is there is excess water. While there is a lack of water in other parts, there is excess water in this part of the country due to a uh, number of rivers crisscrossing the country and uh, there are very severe rains in the during the monsoon times due to which the crops get washed away and uh, the farmers lose their investments they made in the farmlands which has again led to a cycle of not cultivating those lands and poverty and low income which does not uh, generate enough surplus for them to invest back into the agriculture. So it's like a vicious cycle which has entered into that area. And the population grow growth has also not helped smaller land holdings as well as uh, which has led to lower per capita income and lower savings. This uh, per, capita, per capita income being low, the, industri the demand for industrial products also has been low and uh, as, a, as a result there have been no industries which has grown there. In short, uh, the state of Bihar has missed both the agricultural as well as the industrial revolutions which has happened in India. These are some of the micro industry users who were using diesel gensets before we started supplying biomass power to them. What we did 
in response to the challenges being faced by the region, we set up a small uh, biomass gasification plant at the investment of about $170,000, 100,000 dollars, generating about 128 kilowatt hours, uh, kilowatt hours per hour, 128 units per hour. Primarily made out of investments from the directors as well as a small loan and government subsidy. Uh, in the first year, we did not, uh, we were, uh, we made a loss, but in the second year, we will be making a small profit. And going forward, we should be making profits to reinvest in another plant at the existing locations and other plants which we want to scale up. Some of the innovations which we did was we grew a local uh, woody plant called Dhaicha, which is grown in waterlogged areas. And about 10% of the arable land in Bihar is waterlogged. While it is fertile because of the waterway being available and it being in part of the Gangetic Plain, but it's submerged in water and it's very uh, difficult to grow anything here. This plant is uh, can grow in waterlogged areas and is used in the plant as a raw, raw material, which has led to increased income of the farmers. And with that income, they can in, even purchase uh, pow uh, power for running uh, motors for pumping stations. We have also used existing uh, diesel uh, generating gensets who were supplying many on their many grids uh, electricity to local users. We have used them. They are using our electricity instead of diesel generating sets. And we have also uh, did a small innovation about uh, transmitting using high voltage rather than at the normal uh, household voltage of 230 volts. We increased the voltage so that we could cover larger distances and we have, we could, which could sustain the plant which we had set up. These are some pictures which have of the Dhancha plantations. The number of people benefiting has increased from the time as in visited and which includes a lot of farmers who work in the plant as well as who sell Dhancha, who buy uh, water, shopkeepers, coal stores which store uh, potatoes there which in turn benefit the farmers. One uh, very interesting fact about this compared to other renewable energy, this technology, is that one third of the cost of electricity goes back to the farmers. So apart from renewable uh, source of energy, it is also providing income to the farmers. These are some more users. We have seen, saved about 103 tons of carbon and 77,000 liters of diesel per annum. What we want to do in the future is to replicate the success of this plant in other nearby areas in Bihar, in neighboring UP, West Bengal and even Nepal which is not to the north of Bihar. And we will fund our debt equity. We want to uh, run it like a sustainable profit making venture where profits will be reinvested in the expansion plans. We also want to use biomass briquettes, which people are using in Uganda, to uh, replace wood being used in the rural households, enhance the te technolo technology and skill levels of local people so that they can set up the micro industries in the local area. And the process of change, the, the process to revitalize the area can begin. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Vivek. We're back to the UK now, and we're delighted to be able to find out about the exciting work of one of our UK schools finalists. Um, I have to say that we're really sorry that our second UK schools finalist was not able to be here today. Um, Curry Community High School has got rather important exam period at the moment, and we're delighted they're going to be able to join us tomorrow, but they couldn't afford to take two days out of their um, teaching and exam schedule at the moment. But we're really thrilled to have um, the uh, staff and pupils of Ashley Primary School here today. They've had tremendous success in reducing carbon and really changing attitudes within the school and within the wider community. And we'll see first about this on the film, which I understand features the home of one of the pupils who's here today. Oh, 
Uh, we've lived at this house for about six years now. I have a brother called Will, who's nine years old, a brother called Asher, who's seven, and a brother called Louis, who's five. Well, our headmaster met the man who made the gadget. So you can just go see how much electricity you're using. We turn off all the lights that we're not using. If it's cold, we just put a jumper on it. We don't leave things on standby. 519, and that'll cost 52 pounds. At school, we have lots of solar panels, and we learn about sustainability. Our headmaster wants us to be very green school. We have the EcoDriver software, and that can monitor the energy that we use in the school as a whole, or in each of the separate buildings. 2009 is really low. We're trying to not use as much electricity. And, and we have three um, tubes, um, yeah. which um, sunlight reflects on them, and they make the room lighter so we don't have to use the lights. We've noticed where we consume a lot of electricity, and that's really been the key for us, because that's helped everyone to start to change their behaviour. This is about conservation into consciousness. It's about all of us thinking of a better way of living which uh, holds conservation at the core. Energy, saving life goals. Switch off lights. The biomass boiler. Solar tubes. Solar panels. Water butts. The veggie garden. Less kilowatts an hour equals less, less CO2. CO2. What is sustainability is a big question. Two years ago, I went to Antarctica. It was really that experience that made me realize that we actually needed to start to do something and we needed to start to do it in a way that could in engage everyone. Richard has put together an Antarctic curriculum to introduce the whole sustainability agenda to children at a very young age. With younger children, we want them to just appreciate their world. That's Madam Flappy, that one. No, no, that one's Madam Flappy. That's oh, Madam yeah. Flappy, and this is Pip. That's Ginger. It's just for like eggs. Yeah, we'll see if it's which we eggs, take actually. home. No eggs. Oh well. Well, as we move right up to the top of the school, we're really then getting our children to analyse what we do in this school, the energy we use, how much CO2 it produces, uh, and most importantly, where they can start to. Uh, influence change. We set in place what we called carbon challenges. I pledge to get as many energy saving products in my house as possible. We introduce what we call the 100 Club. It's about the children and this school community saving energy and keeping it below 100 every day. And so far every time we've got under 100, which is quite yeah. good. The first year we achieved a 50% reduction in our electricity. The second year it was a 28% further reduction. It's changed the thinking of the children in a very cultural way and it's now beginning to affect the families. One of the exciting things that we're doing is sharing what's been achieved here at Ashley with other schools, businesses that the school's linked with and the impact that it's had there has been significant. The message is if they start to see what they can do and what we can all do, then uh, we will start to see the change. So we're doing everything we can, really. Making a better future of your children's children's children. And children. Yeah. It's something you need to do, because otherwise... Mm -hmm. Unless just... you want to be living on a planet which is practically made of rubbish. Yeah. Which I'm not sure most people do. Okay. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Richard Dunn, Aaron, Megan, Joshua and Ellie, who are going to tell you more about how they've done this fantastic achievement at Ashley Primary School. Thank you, Anne. Good afternoon, everyone. Sustainable energy is the future. Our children are the future. So what better way for us to share the Ashley story than through our children? We couldn't bring all nearly 300 of them today, but we do have four, Aaron, Joshua, Ellie, and Megan. And they will share a little bit more about the story that has started in Antarctica, has gone into Ashley School, and now continues beyond. Thank you. Joshua, do you want to tell us about 
Two years ago, our head teacher, Mr. Dunn, traveled to the last true wilderness of the world, Antarctica. The journey to Antarctica took him from the southern tip of South America, across the turbulent sea to Drake Passage, to a magical world of snow and ice and silence. His visit was part of an expedition to appreciate the stunning beauty of Antarctica, but also to understand that the solar region is changing and melting in truly dramatic ways. I show the breaking away from the continent faster than scientists predicted. Icebergs are carving into the sea at ever increasing rates. The ice is melting drop by drop, and it is our lifestyle that creating the difference. If the pack ice that freezes over the sea melts earlier in the season, the phytoplankton under the ice does not bloom as much. This in turn means that shrimp like krill does not have as much to feed on. And this results in those further up the food chain, the penguins, the seals, the whales having less to eat. It is changing their lives. So, do we listen to the cry of the penguin as his frozen land continues to melt? Has the penguin's icy cool started to melt our hearts? Or do we continue in business as usual? Well, at Ashley School, we have heard the call and we have responded, beginning a journey of carbon reduction that has achieved amazing results. <laughs> the first thing we did at school was to convert our old gas boiler to a biomass boiler from a locally sourced wood pellet. It isn't as cheap to run as gas, but we know that we are reducing our emissions and we are relying on a sustainable source of fuel that comes from a few miles down the road. Next we installed solar thermal panels to provide hot water for our new block and school pool. Yes, we need the warm summer sun for the panels really to have an impact, but we love the fact that the water is heated by clean solar energy. And we install solar photovoltaic panels to generate electricity for our new block. In the summer months, the sun's energy means that we don't need to use any energy from the grid. We become carbon neutral. Just as importantly, we upgraded our school buildings with low energy lighting, double glazed windows and doors, and solar tubes that bring light down from the roof, down into our corridor and cloakroom spaces. Cool! <laughs> but the biggest change of all was that we started to measure our energy using a fantastic software system called an eco driver which uses a pulse meter to record energy consumption in various parts of our school. The eco-driver has been the key to our energy reduction program. We can look at the energy we consume every half hour during the day and analyse where and how we can use less. It has made us challenge our teachers to photocopy less and to ask our kitchen staff not to leave on equipment for so long. We even challenged Mr. Dunn to run fewer evening meetings, which he was rather pleased about. <laughs> the eco driver also means that we can look at our energy consumption over a week and compare one week's figures with another, or even the same week as the previous year, as you can see here. The block graph is dated from last year, and the line graph highlights how we are performing this. And we can get summary reports that show us how much we can chew, or in this case, produce over a year, month by month. Last year, we started what we called the 100 Club. Every day of the school week, we had to keep our energy below 100 kilowatt hours. If we achieved our goal on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we received ten pounds from Mr. Dunn. Yes! <laughs> and if we went below 50 kilowatt hours for the day, we got an extra ten pounds for each day we did it. Even better! <laughs> At the end of each term, our school council then decide what we spend the money on to save 
creating energy in the positive, motivating part of school life. We are still going with the 100 Club, although we did have to increase the number to 120 during the winter months to keep the challenge realistic. Sustainable energy learning has made us energy literate. That we now understand how much appliances is consumed through data handling work in our math and science lessons. And the setting of targets has motivated us to get better and better at conserving our energy. So much so that last year our electricity consumption dropped by 51% on the previous year and we are still falling. Very excitingly, we are sharing our successes and our learning with other schools and we have invited our parents to take part in the 100 Club Challenge at home with the aim of keeping consumption below 100 kilowatt hours per week. We have over 70 families involved at the moment. In just under two weeks time, our Year 6 children will head to Chamonix by train to learn about the issues of climate change on their Inspire Alpine Expedition 2. Our time away will focus on the meaning of well-being at an individual, team and global level. We will touch the shrinking glaciers of the Alps and understand climate change for real. Most importantly, we will learn that individual, team and global well-being are being all interconnected and that we have a role to play in looking after each other and our world. The experience will give us time to see things in a new way and hopefully return inspired to change things for the better. But for today, we want to leave you with what we believe to be the five key points that have led our energy reduction programme. One, create a team of passionate people to lead the energy project. Two, start monitoring your energy on a regular basis. If you can, with an energy monitoring system that gives you the data you need. Three, think about ways in which you can use natural light more and to artificial light less. Four, get into the habit of shutting down appliances every day at the socket and make sure everything is off at weekends and in the holidays. Five, keep the energy work high profile and celebrate your success as you go. Thank you yeah. and good luck. Well, thank you so much to Aaron, Megan, Joshua and Ernie for a brilliant presentation. And I think it's really good where we're not just given a brilliant presentation, we're actually told quite simply at the end what we've got to go away and do. I think that's really helpful. Um, I'd like to take questions now for everyone in this group. So if we could just bring a few extra chairs up so that there's space for everybody. Okay, this is a question for John on the um, Super Homes program. Where does the money come from? Okay, the two things here is where the homeowner gets the money from and where the charity gets the money from to help them open the house. First of all, the homeowner. The homeowner typically has to spend around about £20,000. This is not small money that gets thrown under, you know, under the table. This is serious money that has to be done, but it's done once every hundred years. Okay, so to recognise this is about the money that people in these sort of houses spend on upgrading their kitchen or their bathroom. So it's a question of, of really reallocating those resources. And these people that we've seen, and the, the 26 other people uh, who've got home, uh, who've got super homes so far, um, they all do. They all have done this. Okay, so that's where they get the money from. Um, that covers everything, by the way. You get a boiler for that. You get the solar panels. You get internal or external insulation. You get uh, draft stripping, you know, new windows, and so on. So you get the package there. All right. What else? And and uh, now, where do we, as a as a as a charity, get the money to do that? It's through donations and through. Uh, through various organisations who give, give us money. Um, 
I think the trick in the seeds is that we get this fantastic multiplier. We're very, very dependent on the homeowners who do most of the work. We should give them some money to open the houses, not a lot, but it, it's, uh, uh, it, it covers some of the, the, the small expenses. Um, we can also help in some cases people to open their houses because we have a, a reserve of money, but the, the Ashton Ward, we get any of it, will go to in that direction. Does that answer your question? For the pupils of Ashley School, where are us adults going wrong, and what's it, how are you going to change us? <laughs> are you changing them? <laughs> They're all tongue-tied now. <laughs> Travel on trains and buses more than usual cars. Are you changing them? Yes, sir. Uh, Joe, we're, we're having a private conversation here. I think one of the things that I've noticed in what they're doing is that they are taking the message home and changing their, their parents' behaviour at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're doing it in a very positive way because we try and be really positive about it in school. It's not about beating the children over, over the head with a stick, so to speak. It's about saying if you do the right things, you can be rewarded for it. And hopefully that's what you're doing at home, isn't it? Please nod your heads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we got our funding primarily through EDF Energy. Um, we looked into various funding sources working with an organization called the Energy Center for Sustainable Communities. So they guided us into the application process. Uh, we put in three applications and were successful just with one, but we got a good sum of money from them and we got additional sums from within our school community. Um, I think we balanced it up and said we're making considerable savings in other areas of our energy consumption, the gas and the electricity, um, and therefore we're prepared to make the... Um, uh, you know, make the additional payments to put in um, the wood pellets. I think I'm, I'm hopeful uh, in our school that because we're locally sourcing the pellet and because the market is becoming more competitive, and this summer I've already had two people approach the school and say, we can get you a better deal than you're, you currently have, that that com competitive nature will, will benefit the school in the long run and who knows what will happen with other fossil fuels. So we're balancing it up, really. Thank you. Okay, so question for Vivek is what kind of advice and training do they give to people that are using the electricity? <coughs> the people using the electricity are not new to electricity. They have been using it. Uh, they, it's just that we are replacing the diesel gener generating sets with the, the biomass plant, electricity from biomass, instead of the diesel generating sets. So they, they, they know how to use electricity and they've been using it for years. Just the sources change for them. You, you may be referring to the uh, industry where they were welding. Maybe that's an area to look at where we can improve how uh, they can improve the systems so that it's safer for them to work. That's one area we can look at because that's the existing uh, setup they have in the shops. Maybe we can look to change it. At the, for the moment, we're just supplying the electricity to them. Maybe we can help them better those systems. Thank you. Hear it. So the question is, is Richard pushing the governors or are they pushing him? And whatever, how do we make sure it happens in every school? Uh, it's a very important point. I think our biggest challenge right now in education is to inspire leaders in education, head teachers specifically, to understand that this is just as, as important as SATS results and need tables, whilst not um, denigrating them at all, uh, in terms of, you know, children need to be articulate, literate, numerate. But we need them to understand, as Megan said earlier, that energy literacy is an incredibly important part of our future. Um, so head teachers are the key for me, and absolutely, we need to get that message out to 
leaders in schools and say to them, you must put it right at the core of your agenda and you must drive that change. My governors have been very supportive of what we've done in school. They've been absolutely fantastic. And it might be that certain governors in schools can influence that change. But I've worked with schools where teachers have been wholly passionate about their work, and Carrie will know examples of that. But because the head teacher hasn't supported them, it's really not gone anywhere. And that's, that's a, a big challenge. Uh, to reassure you, I am speaking at the National College of School Leadership on Friday, and I'm sharing this message with them there. Um, uh, the question is, why aren't we getting the push from the top on this? Um, I, th I think um, it, maybe Richard or some of our other UK uh, finalists would like to answer that. I should say, uh, in, in case there are different people here now, we are hold hosting a dinner for our UK finalists to meet UK policymakers this evening um, and push some of these sort of highly relevant points with them. I don't know whether anybody else would like to make a comment. Richard. I'd like to recommend Richard Dunn, the Prime Minister. <laughs> Well, we'll bear that in mind. Uh, if, can I just say one thing, yes. which I think is, is vision. Uh, I think we need really strong vision on this to make it a reality. And you're absolutely right. People are too short-term. They look at elections. They look at short-term solutions. And they're not ultimately solutions. Uh, they're stop gaps. They're, they're resolving the problem in, in a very limited way. We need big vision, and we need the, a massive commitment Absolutely, at top leadership right through to make it work. This is for Vivek about how the electricity industry is regulated in Bihar and does he have a specific agreement with the Bihar Electricity Board? Yeah, the electricity sector in India opened up in 2003 uh, with the new Electricity Act uh, enacted by the central government where in rural areas we could set up generating units and distribute, but within rural areas. Uh, you need to have a license to distribute in urban areas. So we are very much within the law if, by generating in rural areas and distributing there. Thank you. Okay, there's a bit of maths here. We're um, trying to relate 500,000 houses a year at a cost of £20,000 a house to the total investment that's needed. Okay. First of all, the 500,000 houses a year. We've got about 20 million houses. We've got 40 years to, to meet the government's target. That gives 500,000 houses a year. Le less in the first part of the program, a lot more in the second part of the program. 20,000 pounds a house, okay. That, what it turns out is that the you can have a very strong multiplier effect by um, uh, that the, the Germans do by not giving it all as grant, but giving it to subsidise the loan costs. So you can get a situation where you get a, a low repayment costs, which are lower than the, your fuel bill savings, and you have no money to put up front, and th that's a terrific deal. And that works out well for the Germany. Germany has put in last year, uh, 2007, 850 million euros into this program, to their program, and got 5 billion euros of effort on site. That's the multiplier, about five and a half, six to one. That's how those numbers will work out. So for not an awful lot of money, it is a lot of money, but not an awful lot of money, you can get an awful lot of a benefit. And it also saves in unemployment benefit. And about out of that two billion, nearly a billion of that, is, um, you can get back because you don't have to pay unemployment benefit. So really it only costs just about a billion. It's a great deal. Thank you, me. So there are three separate parts of the question for Vivek. The first is you're working at 35% capacity factor at the moment. What can you do to get that up? The second is the flaring of methane. What are, you, what are your views on that? And the third is, are you encouraging monoculture by relying on mainly on one sort of biomass to supply the plant? Yeah, Answers to your, answer to your first question is, uh, 
35 percent was the utilization maybe a month back which was the time when the case study was being written uh, the plant was designed in such a fashion that it is right in the middle of two villages and uh, the challenge was to uh, transport the electricity to meet the energy cluster the requirements in various clusters where all these micro industries and households were located so the initial plan was to uh, build three distribution lines uh, the first one mm, led to 35 percent capacity utilization as and when uh, in fact the when the Ashton process was uh, being completed we were in the process of setting up the second one which led to currently it is around uh, 60 percent utilization and uh, which will we with this second line we can go up to 100 as well because it takes time to connect various users to the grid to the system which we have set up local grid while there is a provision of a third uh, transmission line as well which will require building up another gasifier and engine system at the existing location that would mean it would take a utilization more than 100 percent of the current capacity and would require additional capacity uh, that was sorry the second the second question was about firing methane yeah this is an internal internal combustion engine which we use so me methane is a part of the producer gas which is being consumed there so uh, I really uh, I do, it's not a hazard as such and the third question um, was related to um, if you're relying on mainly one type of uh, plant as the fuel are you encouraging monoculture right uh, no we are not relying on one uh, par one plant per se it's uh, this dhancha is uh, uh, contributing to only 70 percent of the requirements we are using partly wood as well as maize cobs and uh, other plants uh, other uh, agricultural residue like mustard stock it's all a mixture of various kinds of uh, agri residue which is being used Thanks. okay so how long does it take somebody to pay back the 20,000 pounds they invest in energy saving um, I might just chip in actually you know how long does it take you to pay back the 20,000 pounds you invest in a kitchen <laughs> anyway it's John's question not mine so thank you you pretty well answered it <laughs> there is there, payback it, okay what does payback mean okay in terms of kitchen or whatever in Australia where this has been done the value of the house has gone up by six percent okay over that took ten years to arrive on the marketplace but it's worth 6%. That more than pays for the bits in any London house, for sure. Okay, so straight away, you don't have to do cost effectiveness. It just pays back. All right, so that's number one. Number two, if we follow the German scheme or another scheme in this country which is being proposed or pays, then after 25 years, as you're paying the money back, the money is more that you, the loans are more than repaid by the fuel bill savings. So it's an immediate payback, year one, and that just goes on for the total of the time of the loan. Okay, so that that's you know there is no payback. It's just instant. All right, so you can twiddle and push these numbers quite gently uh, to get a situation where the householder does not actually have to go through this loathsome business of payback times, which nobody really understands. Nobody uses for any other purchase they make. It's just it just works out. All right, and that's why the German scheme I think is so successful. You get something for virtually nothing. All right. Does that answer your question, or would you like more? <laughs> Sorry? Because they can't get soft loans yet. They can't get low interest loans. And that's why we're pushing for this billion a year to come from the government to follow the German scheme, which has been highly successful, or an equivalent scheme that's going. It's, it's, it's really is the way forward in the first early years until there's a market established that there is an additional asset value to doing this. Just like if you have a well-painted house or you have a kitchen, you ask why, where the payback for a ki good kitchen is or a good bathroom, you sell the house better. That's, that's, where the, that's the payback. I mean, apart from getting the pleasure out of it. And this also gives pleasure because it's a warmer place to be in, um, just generally more comfortable, generally quieter. It's a nicer house. Okay, we'll have to, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, that, the last question went on quite long, so I don't think we can take any more. As I said, that would be the last. 
So I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the presenters this afternoon. Thank you very much.